Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute, helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer envisions a world that embraces love as a guiding principle and animating force for our lives, a powerful love that helps us live in sacred relationship with ourselves, others, and the natural world. Learn more by visiting Fetzer.org. It took me a while to put a name to the rare quality that is palpable in Jean Vanier's life and presence. It's a wisdom of tenderness. He's a philosopher and a Catholic social innovator and simply one of the great elders in our world today. The L'Arche movement, which he founded, centers around people with mental disabilities. He has devoted his life to the practical application of Christianity's most paradoxical teachings, that there's power in humility, strength in weakness, and light in the darkness of human existence. The 149 L'Arche communities in 38 countries have become places of pilgrimage, transformative for those involved and for the world around them. It's the realization of how to create a culture which is no longer a culture just of competition, but a culture of welcoming, where tenderness, where touch is important. And it's not either sexualized nor aggressive. It has become human. And I think that this is what people with disabilities are teaching us. It's, it's something about what it means to be human and to relate and and to celebrate life together. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Jean Vanier grew up during World War II, the son of a prominent French-Canadian statesman. He still lives in the original L'Arche community in Trosley-Broy, France. I sat with him in Maryland in 2007 while he was leading a retreat for college students. The story of L'Arche, which is French for the Ark, began in 1964. Jean Vanier was a professor of philosophy at St. Michael's College in Toronto. He'd done his doctoral work on happiness in the ethics of Aristotle. At Christmas time that year, he went to visit a friend in France who was working as a chaplain for men with mental handicaps. He was especially moved by a vast asylum south of Paris in which all day, 80 adult men did nothing but walk around in circles and take a two-hour compulsory nap. He bought a small house nearby and invited two men from that asylum to share life with him. This was not a linear career move. Jean Vanier had entered the British Royal Naval College as a teenager and commanded an aircraft carrier in his 20s. When he left the military, before he studied philosophy, he spent a year in a contemplative community in a poor area near Paris. L'eau vive, as it was called, water of life, was dedicated to serving the poor, praying, and studying metaphysics. That community near Paris had been founded by a French Dominican priest. And he was very deeply a man of God. I think I had a very open intelligence, you know, since the age of 13, I'd been in the world of the Navy, I hadn't Mm -hmm. done philosophy, I hadn't done any particular reading, I mean, I was geared for the military, but here was somebody who opened up new visions, new vistas. I remember once following his courses and... uh, he was so up in it, and he was saying, he was talking about something in metaphysics, and he said, you know, take a very concrete example, the angels, for example. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> laughed, and he couldn't understand, you know, why people were laughing, because it was for him a very concrete example. <laughs> so uh, he was a metaphysician, he was a thinker, he was a, uh, really a man of God. And he was the one who encouraged me to do studies, and encouraged me particularly to to work on Aristotle. And the big thing with Aristotle is the primacy of experience over idea. Hmm. A lot of people don't know that. The the worst thing that can happen is for Aristotelians to become Aristotelians, because then they start reading Aristotle, but they're no longer in linked with Uh. reality, to touch reality, Mm -hmm. to listen to people, to see the world evolving, and so on. Right. Something so interesting you said... um that Aristotle talked about an ethics of desire that is resonant with who we are today because people want to have meaning in their lives, which Aristotle identified, and they want to be thrilled by it. And you said an ethics of desire is good news for us 
at a time when we have become allergic to an ethics of law. Yeah, yeah. So see, for the heart of everything with Aristotle, desire and pleasure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for Aristotle, pleasure is not you know, something which is just sort of fooling around. Pleasure is when you have an activity which you have performed well, be it philosophizing or struggling for justice, whatever you do and you do well, it's filled with pleasure. Mm. It's, a, it's mm -hmm. joyful. The fulfillment of a desire in an activity you're doing well. And what I think is so edifying about talking about that this week, I think often people might say, look at the life you've led and the work you do and contrast that with what they might call our pleasure-seeking, entertainment-oriented society. But what I hear when you talk about Aristotle is you're not condemning that basic impulse that we have to seek pleasure, to, you know, um, you're just saying that we can take that to a much deeper and more profound level. Yeah, it's just finding where, what activity will give you the greatest and the deepest pleasure. I mean, for some people, it might be drinking whiskey and mm -hmm. rock and so on. But for me, it was to find a meaning through philosophy, through my relationship with Jesus, through justice, through, mm -hmm. through a struggle. I mean, and it's true that I sense deeply that I've always been really a happy person. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean to say I haven't had difficulties. That doesn't mean to say I didn't go through difficult conflicts or stuff like that. But fundamentally, I've had a pleasurable life, a mm -hmm. joyful life. Talk to me, though, about, you know, how you can you connect a word like pleasure and this longing with the place where I really sense you found your calling, you understood what was meaningful for you when you went back to France and you encountered men in an asylum and somehow you were seized by that and that has kind of mapped out the direction of your life. Yes, I come back to the reality of pleasure and to the reality of what is my deepest desire mm -hmm. and what is your deepest desire and what... And somewhere the deepest desire for us all is to be appreciated, to be loved, and to be seen as somebody of value, but not just seen, and Aristotle makes a difference between being admired and being loved. Mm. When you admire people, you put them on pedestals. When you love people, you want to be together. So really the first meeting I had with people with disabilities, what touched me was their cry for relationship. Some of them had been in the psychiatric hospital, others, all of them had lived pain and the pain of rejection. One of the words of, of Jesus to, the, to Peter, mm -hmm. and you find this at the end of the, the Gospel of St. John, do you love me? Do you love me? So there's the cry of God saying, do you love me? And the cry of people who have been wounded, put aside, who have lost trust in themselves, they've been considered as mad and all the rest. And their cry is, do you love me? And it's these two cries that come together. Not just in the context of disabilities, you know, you've posed this question, you know, the whole qu you've said the whole question is, how do we stand before pain? Yeah. All kinds of pain and weakness mm -hmm. are difficult mm -hmm. for, for us as human beings. Why is that so excruciating? Why do we do such a bad job with it? I think there's so many elements. First of all, we, we don't know what to do with our own pain, so what to do with the pain of others. We don't know what to do with our own weakness, except hide it or pretend it doesn't exist. So how can we welcome fully the weakness of another if we haven't welcomed our own weakness? Mm -hmm. The very strong words of Martin Luther King, his question was always, how is it that one group the white group, uh, can despise another group, which is the black group. And mm -hmm. will it always be like this? Will we always be having an elite condemning or pushing down others that they consider non, not worthy? And he says something which is quite, what I find extremely beautiful and strong, is that we will continue to despise people until we have recognized, loved, and accepted. 
what is despicable in ourselves. Mm. So that then we go down, well, what is it that is despicable in ourselves? And there are some elements despicable in ourselves which we don't want to look at, but which are part of our nature, is that we are mortal. <laughs> we are very fragile in front of the future. The accidents and sicknesses is, is the reality. We are born in extreme weakness, mm -hmm. and our life will end in extreme weakness. So this, people don't want to hold on to that. They want to prove something. They want security. They want to have big bank accounts and, and all that sort of stuff. But then also, oh, lots of fears within us. Yes. We are a frightened people. And of course, the big question is, why are we so frightened of people with disabilities? Mm -hmm. Like a, a woman who said to me just recently, asked me where I what I was doing, and I said that I had the privilege of living with people with disabilities. And she said, oh, but I could never work with people. And I said, why not? And she said, well, I'm frightened of them. It touches very, and I, I believe we're in front of a mystery of the human reality. And people who are very deeply disfigured in their face, in their body, and so on. And it's the fault of nobody. It's a reality that is there. And maybe we can work things out and discover what gene it is and so on. But the history of humanity is a history of people being born extremely fragile because sickness and death is part of our, mm -hmm. of our, of our reality. And as you've also pointed out many times, we all have, what did you say, you can call them our, our weaknesses, our limitations, our disfigurements. Um, they don't all show on our bodily surface, right? But somehow that we recoil when, yeah. when it shows. Yeah. You see, there's such a need to be appreciated, such a need to be loved, with that sense somewhere that if they see what is broken in me, they'll no longer love me. So somewhere there has to be a, a, a complete change that we love people not because they're beautiful or clever or they, because they're a person. You, know, you told a story when I heard you speak at St. John's University years ago about very happy members of your community. Do you remember that oh, story? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, I was sitting at that with a man who was a bit glum, like a lot of people, a bit glum, everything. And anyway, there was a knock on the door, and before I could say come in, Jean-Claude walked in, and Jean-Claude technically would be Down syndrome. And uh, Jean-Claude shook my hand and laughed and shook the hand of the other fellow and, and laughed and uh, went out laughing. And... Uh, the man that had been in my office looked at me and said, isn't it sad, children like that? <laughs> and, I mean, he, what was sad was that he was totally blind. He didn't see that Jean-Claude was happy. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, the wisdom of tenderness with Jean Vanier. He created L'Arche, a model of religious community centered around people with mental and intellectual disabilities. You know, you've written that from the point of view of faith, those who are marginalized and considered failures can restore balance to our world. Talk to me about that. The balance of our world frequently is seen as a question of power. That uh, if I have more power and more knowledge, more capacity, then I can do more. But there's this tension between the doing and the being. And when we have power, we can very quickly um, push people down. I'm the one that knows, and you don't know, and I'm strong, and I'm powerful, I have the knowledge, and this is the history of humanity. Yes. And that is all of what I'd call the whole educational system, is that we must educate people to become capable and to take their place in society. Mm -hmm. That has value, obviously, but it's not quite the same thing as to educate people to relate, to listen to help people to become themselves. 
So the equilibrium that people with disabilities can bring is precisely this equilibrium of the heart. Hmm. Children. You see, maybe a, a, a father is a very strong man and businessman. And when he comes home, if he gets down on his hands and knees and plays with the children, it's the child that is teaching the father something about tenderness, hmm. about love, about the father looking at the needs of the child, the face of the child, the hands of the child, relating to the child. And the children, the incredible thing about children is they're unified in their, in their body. And in, whereas we, we can be very disunified. We can say one thing and feel another. Right. And so as a child can teach us about unity and about fidelity and about love. So it is people with disabilities. There's the same sort of beauty and purity in, in some of these people that is extraordinary and say our world is not just a world of competition. The weakest and the strongest, everybody have their place. That's, um, it seems that you have developed quite an important theology of the body through your work with Lars. I mean, I think maybe you're just you're edging towards it there, but it's 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 bigger than that also. Yes, I, I, you see, Lausch is not based first on the word. You find a lot of communities which are based on the word. That's to say, we speak of an ideal together, and we are committed to an ideal or to a vision, and so on. But Lausch is based on 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 body, and on suffering bodies, and so they are seen as useless. And so we welcome those who apparently are useless. Hmm. And it's the suffering body which brings us together. And it's our attention to the body. You see, when somebody comes to our community and is quite severely handicapped, what is important is to see that the body is well, bathing, helping people dress, to eat. It's to communicate to them through the body. And then as the body can become comfortable, then the spirit can rise up. Hmm. There's a recognition, there's a contact, there's a relationship. We see this with some of our people, like Francoise. Francoise came to our community in 1978. Very severe handicap. She couldn't speak. She could walk a bit. She couldn't dress herself. She was incontinent. And she couldn't eat by herself. And today she is nearly 30 years older. She's become blind. And a beautiful person. There was somebody who came to our community not too long ago who was, saw Francoise. And the reaction was, well, what is the point of keeping Francoise alive? Mm. And the leader of the little house said, but madam, I love her. <laughs> I mean, it's as if you come into a home and grandma is in the home and she has Alzheimer's and you say, well, what is it? But she's my grandmother. <laughs> I mean, it, it, so it's, it's based on the body and then from the body, relationship grows. Hmm. You know that when I went to spend a few days in a large community, I've never been hugged so much in my life. Mm. It's very physical, joyfully physical mm. And without, you know, some of the inhibitions, you know, on the one hand, yes, our culture says bodies have to be beautiful and faces have to be beautiful, but we also sexualize everything so that touch becomes complicated and touch was so uncomplicated and it was also so appropriate. That, that has been something very important for me because in the Navy and in the time after the Navy, I think I was somebody a little bit frightened of relationships, particularly if with women. Um, I was a man who was, knew how to be efficient and quick, and uh, I knew how to teach, I knew how to give commands in the Navy and so on. And then in, in, uh, live, starting to live in Larche with Raphael and Philippe, it was precisely the realization what they were crying out for was touch, but also maybe that's what I was crying out for. Mm. And what we would what I would call safe touch. Yes. That's to say a touch which secu gives security and reveals. The way one can put one's arm around the shoulder of some it's not to possess them, it's no. not to hold on to them, it's to reveal. Mm -hmm. 
And I see this now, you know, it's, it's super getting older because now I'm 79. And uh, very quickly, you know, I was in, responsible for one of the homes after I left the directorship. And now these people who are still in the home, uh, they'll be saying to me, you're looking tired. And, and now after 70, they said, you don't have to do the washing up anymore. <laughs> so, so the very fact that I'm getting older and weaker have brought them closer to me and uh, come up to me and hug me like somebody like Janine, who was a very violent woman who had hemiplegia and epilepsy. And, so, and gradually she became very peaceful. But sometimes I'd go and sit down beside her and she'd put her hand on my head and she'd <laughs> say, poor old man. <laughs> there was a sort of tenderness. In her. So it's the realization of how to create a culture which is no longer a culture just of competition, but a culture of welcoming, where tenderness, where touch is important. And it's not either sexualized nor aggressive. It has become human. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is what people with disabilities are teaching us. It's, it's something about what it means to be human mm -hmm. and to relate and, and to celebrate life together. After a short break, more with Jean Vanier. You can always listen again and hear the unedited version of every show we do on the On Being podcast feed. Now with bite-sized extras wherever podcasts are found. On Being is brought to you by the John Templeton Foundation. The Templeton Foundation harnesses the power of the sciences to explore the deepest and most perplexing questions facing humankind. Learn about cutting-edge research on the science of generosity, gratitude, and purpose at templeton.org forward slash discoveries. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. I'm speaking today with one of the wise voices in our world, the French-Canadian philosopher and social innovator Jean Vanier. He founded the L'Arche Movement a half-century ago. This model of community began with one home in France and is now in 38 countries on six continents. Mentally disabled core members share daily life and spiritual community with non-disabled assistants. As described in the writings of Jean Vanier, Henry Nouwen, and others, this experience is transformative for all involved and for the world around them. Large communities today draw members and visitors or pilgrims from many traditions. Within Roman Catholicism, Jean Vanier is considered by some to be a living saint. I met him in 2007. You know, this question that Jesus asks, who, who do you say that I am? I wonder how you answer that question or respond to that question here at 79. My experience today is much more the discovery how vulnerable God is. You see, God is so respectful of our freedom. And if, as the epistle of John says, that God is love, anyone who has loved in their life knows they become vulnerable. Where are you and the other person? and do you love me back? So if God is love, it means that God is terribly vulnerable. And God doesn't want to enter into a relationship where he's obliging or she is obliging us to do something. There's a beautiful text in the Apocalypse, the book of Revelations. I stand at the door and I knock. If somebody hears me and opens the door, then I will enter. What touches me there is God knocking at the door, not kicking the door down, but waiting. Do you, will you open? Do you hear me? Because we're in a world where there's so much going on in our heads and our hearts and anxiety and projects that we don't hear God knocking at the door of our hearts. 
So I'd say that what touches me the deepest, maybe because I'm becoming myself more vulnerable, is the discovery of the vulnerability of, of God, who doesn't oblige. The other element, which is probably again linked to that, is that the only thing that's what I see important for myself is just to become a friend of Jesus hmm. and nothing else. And, and the whole, I think, of the mystery of Christianity is just living with Jesus the way Jesus lived in Nazareth with, his, with Mary, his mother, and with Joseph, something, a relationship. John the Baptist was strong, he was powerful, <laughs> he was prophetic. Jesus was quiet, and he ate with people who were caught up in prostitution, with tax collectors, with lepers, and all that. I mean, there's something so simple about Jesus that he is disarming. Mm. We don't quite know what to do with it, because frequently we would want a powerful Jesus who will put everything straight, who will cure everybody, who will do everything that we tell him to do. And it's not like that. And of course, um, one implication of, of, this, of God, the vulnerable God, of honoring human freedom, is, is precisely this, this dark side that, you know, that we've been talking about, that human beings cause each other pain, dominate, and destroy and so, you know, so then I'm kind of coming back at you with the, the theodicy question, the, the question of um, still if God is God, you know, is, is that enough to honor our freedom? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's so many things we don't know. And I mean, I just have to honor what I don't know. You know and uh, I can't, there's so many things I cannot explain. Because explanation is something about headiness. We yes. want to have it in the head. Mm -hmm. But the whole question is not to understand, but it's to be attracted to the place of pain uh, in order to give support to those who are suffering. So if we spent, maybe I'm making something, but if we tried to know too much, it might cut us away from being present mm. in the degree according to where I'm at and how I am, it is vital that I be present to situations. There's a very moving thing with St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis said he couldn't stand lepers. And one can understand the disfigured leper mm. with no nose or no ear or parts of gaping, you know, and in the Middle Ages, there was something like, in Europe, 20,000 leprosiums, you know, and filled with these people that, you know, smelt bad. And he said, I, I hated it. I, I couldn't stand it. And then he said that one, one day the Lord brought me to the lepers. And when I left, there was a new gentleness in my body and in my spirit. I, what struck me when he said a new gentleness mm -hmm. in my body and in my spirit. And it says from there, I really left to serve the Lord. So Francis, the conversion, when I say the conversion, I, I'm talking about a change of attitude because conversion is a change of attitude. It's not just a question of changing religion, all that sort of stuff. It's a, an inner change. And from the sort of fear and despisal of what appeared the most dirty, which in his period was the, the smell of the leper, and that he discovered that there was a presence of God in the leper. Hmm. So we can then begin to understand the whole mystery of rejection of God, because we don't want a God. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, who's hidden in the dirt mm. or in, hidden in dirty people or in smelly people or disfigured people or in those people who are in the, the refugee camps throughout the world and so on. You are deeply Catholic, I believe, and um, you were raised in the Roman Catholic tradition and are steeped in 
Catholic theology and um, and the large communities are Christian at their core and you know, based on this essence of your understanding of God and Jesus that you've been describing and and one interesting thing that's happened I think in the course of this great experiment of large is that you know the communities in India also have Hindu participants and I was reading something you wrote recently that your community in France now has some Muslim members of the community. And I wonder um, if that surprises you or, you know, how you've experienced that to happen and uh, how that participation of people from other faiths mm, adds to the knowledge, to, to your sense of, of what this means or your theology or anthropology. It's important. And I'm glad you began by saying Catholic. See, Catholic means universal. Yes, right. And, uh, Catholic with a small C. And, yeah, mm-hmm. to see the Catholicism is an openness. You see, the heart of God is open. But th- there was a tendency when I was younger, when I left the Navy, of a co- Catholicism where there was a sort of wall around it of the right and the wrong and the better and the best and all that sort of stuff. And it's really very interesting, the, the history of Lash. History of Lash is the relationship between a vision or a principle and experience. Hmm. What has experience uh, taught us? That, for instance, Nadja is a Muslim Moroccan lady in, in the community next door, and I see her quite regularly. And I love listening to her. And I love hearing what she's saying of how she's discovering the heart and relationship, how she's discovering the depth of the Koran. Raki is the head of our community in Calcutta. She's Hindu. I could sit at the feet of that woman and listen to her. She is amazing. Like the last (laughs) time I saw was about a year ago, and she was telling me that in Calcutta, they were having difficulty. We are in a tough area of Calcutta. And she was saying that many of our people with disabilities were being laughed at and people were throwing stones at them. And she said something was going wrong. We were being rejected by the... So we decided, she said, in the community to do a play, a theatre, and that we would take one of Tagore's stories. <laughs> and the Tagore story was the story between somebody who was a very liberal on the religious and a very another man who was very conservative and how they were in conflict and how gradual reconciliation came. She said, we did this and there were 300 people from the local area and they've changed. <laughs> so it's, it's what I've discovered as I've listened to Raki or I've listened to Nadia, the relation between the principle and the experience mm-hmm. has been a sort of movement in Lash over 40 years. And, you know, you could, I could have difficulty with some of the changes or difficulty with discovering that experience is important. Sometimes you want to clutch on to principles and, and yet experience is saying, go further, go further. I think about Lars is, as you say, it's presence, it's physical presence. I, this is another conversation I have with people all the time in different contexts that the world's pain comes to people in Western cultures often through their television sets or through reading some horrific story in a newspaper or seeing an absolutely heartbreaking picture, you know, like a picture I saw of an Iraqi child crying at a funeral the other week that haunted me for days, and yet there's nothing I can do Mm. for that Iraqi Mm. child. Mm. You know, he's Mm. thousands of miles away. I think I'm also aware that uh, it's not only that I 
that I can't touch his pain or the sources of it directly. It's that I don't know his, his sources of solace. I don't know what's going to help him get up the next day mm-hmm. and somehow mm-hmm. start to mm-hmm. heal. Mm-hmm. So I'm just I'm throwing see, that out. I wonder, yeah. It's you see, we're in a, an incredible world of technology, mm-hmm. the global world. And, uh, and yet with television and even with cell phones and internet, we can cut away from relationship, you see. To get an email, you don't see the eyes of the person, you don't see the face, you don't see the smile, you don't see the hands, you don't see the tone of voice. And we have to come down to uh, small is beautiful because small is where we relate. Isn't it funny that global technology may bring us back to small is beautiful? Possibly, <laughs> or take us away from it, because mm-hmm. that's it, you see. Mm-hmm. I mean... Uh, as you looked at that Iraqi child and you were wounded and wanted to do something, yet you were confronted by your incapacity because that child was not in front of you. If that child was in front of you, you could have taken the child in your arms. Mm-hmm. And so we're going into a world where the imagination, the virtual, the long distance, the things far away appear as close, but you can't touch them. They're close to the imagination, but they're not close to the body. So let's come back to the reality of the small. There we can we The can people touch. who live down the street from we us. We can touch them. We can be with them. The difficulty with Lash, which is also our beauty, I say it's our difficulty, it's our beauty is that it's small. Mm-hmm. And it's just very little. And, and it's, it's small, and yet the story of Lash is that from... One community in France. You are yeah. now all yeah. over the world. Yeah. And yeah. You're in Africa. Yeah. You're in yeah. Bangladesh. Yeah. We talked yeah. about Calcutta, yeah. some yeah. of the places you've mentioned. Yes, Lush has grown. But the reality of every day is sometimes quite painful, mm-hmm. the smallness. In a world where people are being pushed to pretend that they're big. I think it is, it's deeply countercultural that you say repeatedly, you don't want with Lush to change the world. That's not the goal. What we can do is what Gandhi says. We can't change the world, but I can change. Hmm. And if I change and I seek to be more open to people and less frightened of relationship, if I begin to see what is beautiful within them, if I recognize also that there's brokenness because I'm also broken and that's okay, then there's something that begins to happen. But it's so counterculture, but that doesn't matter. What has happened, what I sense for the future of our poor little world with all its ecological difficulties and financial difficulties, that maybe the big thing that's going to happen is that little lights of love will spread over the country. Little places where people love each other and welcome the poor and the broken where each other we give to each other their gifts and have these little, little places and that the world is, you know, we, it will never hit the headlines. <laughs> but we'll be creating these little lamps. Then if there are a sufficient number of little, little lamps in each village or each city and parts of the city, well, then the glow will be a little bit greater. What is it you've said? that you, Lars is not meant to be a solution but a sign. Yes, we can't. You see, I remember once I was speaking to a man in a big city of the United States, I won't say it, and he said, give me the formula and I'll create 300 lashes, <laughs> you know, in the next two years. I said, well, it doesn't work like that. It's the transmission of a vision and it's counterculture. But that's okay. Mm-hmm. We are who we are. Krista Tippett with On Being. Today, exploring Jean Vanier's understanding of religious virtue, the pain of the world, and the wisdom of tenderness. I'm sitting with you in outside Washington, and you're meeting with You've been spending the weekend uh, leading a retreat with college students. And I wonder both 
what they teach you. Because I sense that you are a person who encounters other human beings as you talk often about standing with humility before humanity and learning. And so what do you learn from them? And, uh, and I'm also curious about at this stage in your life, what insights are you through what's happening in your body, the aging of your body, the encounter with frailty that we all have at this other end of life? How is that changing there are two, you? Two, there are two questions. questions. Uh, yeah. Two questions. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah, what a beauty of young people is their openness, their yearning, their enthusiasm. On the other hand, uh, a feeling of discouragement because the machine is too big, the machine of the world. Kind of what we've world. been talking about. Yeah, that. It's, it's too big. And they so there's an immense yearning, thirst, but also a fear of commitment. Because in some ways they've been too manipulated. I can think of my adolescence some, <laughs> whatever it is, <laughs> 60 or more years ago. And in a way, things were much simpler. Today, with the technology, there's excitement, and yet we're losing the sense of what it means to be human. This brings me back to the second question, okay. <laughs> uh, which is that I'm human and uh, I have my weaknesses and I have my fragility, I have, uh, physical elements of the heart. And, you know, I have to take things quietly and intellectually uh, I get tired much more quickly. So it's the, uh, just the acceptance of reality. And uh, you see, the big thing for me is to love reality and not live in the imagination, not live in what could have been or what should have been or what can be. No, it's reality. And somewhere to love reality and then discover that God is present mm -hmm. in the reality. That doesn't mean to say that we're just to be passive, to welcome reality, because we also have to know how to react in front of reality. Reality is a beautiful <laughs> reality. But how to just to live that reality and live it with my own body, my own weaknesses, my own need for greater sleep, uh, to get to sleep after lunch and, mm -hmm. and all the rest. I mean, this is, this is my reality. And I know that in so many years' time, would it be five years, I might be in a wheelchair or whatever it is. I mean, I am somebody who is moving towards that ultimate reality, which is much closer, which is death. And uh, my secretary, Barbara, with who was my secretary for 40 years, died uh, last July. And we held hands together for two hours, mm. and she just left. And not to be frightened of death. Death is a passage which will be an extraordinary discovery. Something that will be so amazing that we can't even imagine it. It's like my little niece who died of AIDS. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't a believer. She said, what's it going to be like? And I said, well, you're going to fall asleep. And when you wake up, you'll be in such joy, such peace. Something that you've never, never lived before. And she said, but I'm, I'm not, not a believer. I said, but do you remember when you were in that apartment in Paris and there were some Turkish immigrants and you'd make cakes for them? I've always seen you as somebody kind. Mm. And so your kindness, you will find it'll, it'll be okay. And then the rest we will discover. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be wonderful. This is another something you know. Clearly you know this and all of your philosophy all of your studies can't explain that to you, something you know. Yes, something that we have experienced. You see, if we've experienced somewhere the peace of Jesus, the peace of being with other people, the peace of loving people, well then that experience transcends everything, the ideas we might have, because it's that experience where we live trust, and in Greek, the word faith and trust are the same word. 
trust in other people, trust in God, trust in the peace that is in our hearts, trust also in those who are struggling to find peace and who've got their angers and their pain. That's okay too. We're in it together. I just want to ask you one more question. I'm sure you don't enjoy being reminded that, like Mother Teresa, in her lifetime people said she was a saint, and in Jean Vanier's lifetime they're saying that you are a saint. And um, I don't sense that a lot of your energy has been put into becoming a saint. Um, there was this great shock recently that in Mother Teresa's letters were revealed that she struggled with darkness and depression. And I wonder how you r- responded to that and... and there again, number of questions. Yeah, one. it's a number of questions. <laughs> what is. I respond to that yes. is I knew Mother quite well. Yes. <laughs> she was a fantastic woman. I'd have breakfast with her. And she'd be telling me about her foundation in Yemen and how she was hoping to get to China and what she was doing in Africa and so on. She might have had difficulties in praying, but never... Never, never did she have the slightest doubt in her mission. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think somehow the astonishment over that is connected to what you just said, that you are all about loving reality. And she was facing reality. She may have been a saint by some definition, but that doesn't mean that she was removed from... Darkness. In fact, it meant that she was actually touching it and facing it and grappling with it. She had a lot of anguish. You see, and to bring anguish which she had uh, and then to think that it doubted her faith. She never doubted her faith. But in her prayer that she lived anguish, mm-hmm. you know, this is what everybody lives. I mean, it's, this is human reality. And I think when Mother Teresa was writing, telling these, and I still feel upset because she said that should be destroyed. Mm. And we didn't take seriously what she had said. But she was obviously a woman of great anguish. And so when you're a great anguished, your prayer will be anguish. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't be surprised. I mean, and don't make a big thing out of it. I mean, this is the reality of everyone. And she's telling us now, stop thinking about this anguish. Just get on and start loving people. We must listen to what she said, which was, we will be healed by the poor. So let's get down to it. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Is there anything you want to say about being compared to her as a living saint? Sanctity. Put it in there. What is important is just to become a little friend of Jesus. Okay, that's your last (laughs) word. Thank you very much. Jean Bonnier is founder of the L'Arche Federation. He lives full-time in the original L'Arche community in trusley Broy, France. His books include Befriending the Stranger, An Ark for the Poor, and A Cry is Heard, My Path to Peace. is Chris Hegel, Lily Percy, Mariah Helgeson, Maya Tarrell, Marie Sambalay, Aaron Farrell, Lauren Dordal, Tony Liu, Bethany Iverson, Aaron Colasacco, Kristen Lynn, 
Prophet Adewu, Casper Tech Kyle, Angie Thurston, Sue Phillips, Eddie Gonzalez, Lillian Vo, Lucas Johnson, Damon Lee, Suzette Burley, Katie Gordon, Zach Rose, and Siri Grassley. Special thanks this week to Joan Mahler and Sister Anita. The On Being Project is located on Dakota land. Our lovely theme music is provided and composed by Zoe Keating. And the last voice you hear singing our final credits in each show is hip-hop artist Lizzo. On Being was created at American Public Media. Our funding partners include the John Templeton Foundation, harnessing the power of the sciences to explore the deepest and most perplexing questions facing humankind, Learn about cutting-edge research on the science of generosity, gratitude, and purpose at templeton.org slash discoveries. The Fetzer Institute, helping to build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Find them at fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, working to create a future where universal spiritual values form the foundation of how we care for our common home. Humanity United, advancing human dignity at home and around the world. Find out more at humanityunited.org, part of the Omidyar Group, the Henry Luce Foundation in support of public theology reimagined, the Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives, and the Lilly Endowment, an Indianapolis-based private family foundation dedicated to its founders' interests in religion, community development, and education. On Being is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange, and is a Krista Tippett public production.